Hello everyone. This video is about a recent book by Jeff Hawkins called A Thousand Brains, A New Theory of Intelligence. And there is a foreword the, to the book by Richard Dawkins, which provides a nice introduction and a little summary of the book. What is for me most remarkable about this book is its origin and where it comes from, the context of its writing. So if you believe, as some people do, that to be an original thinker, you also should have an original form of life, that innovation is not just contained in our work and in our ideas, that to, to be innovative, we should innovate in, our, in how we live, in our lifestyle. That's where uh, innovation begins. So if you agree with that, then you would be doubly interested in this book because uh, Jeff Hawkins is someone who is not a typical academic. He founded an independent research company called Numenta that is still uh, that is still active. And before that, he founded another institute, the Redwood Institute for Theoretical Neuroscience. So even though he had training and his part of, parts of his education was in contact and within uh, universities, but his path is quite unique and original. So as I said, this author is not a typical academic. He is also not a celebrity scientist. He's not one of those authors those who I find personally irritating, uh, who insist on being a lovable celebrity as well as a popularizer of, of science. He is an entrepreneur, a polymath, uh, with an intense and genuine interest in understanding the human brain. And this book is his attempt to communicate his main findings in an accessible language. But because of his entrepreneurship, I think, I mean, I may be wrong, but in my judgment, the book is also a piece of marketing and PR, probably. It, it's, a, it's a way of introducing uh, Numenta and that style of doing research, which, you know, I think deserves some publicity. So in the rest of this video, I'm going to first turn to what is good about the book, in my judgment, and then after covering what I find uh, laudable, commendable about the book, enjoyable, then I'll turn to my criticism. So what is good about this book? Well, it's good, likable, enjoyable. First, the first thing that I find really good about the book is that it shows and embodies principles of scientific thinking. Not just, Hawkins doesn't just come in and say, these are things I have found and I believe in. Let me give you a tour of my findings. That's not what he does. He also talks about why we believe in a scientific idea. What is it that makes us regard uh, an idea, a hypothesis, a theory, as worthy of consideration or as plausible, and so forth. Next, the, the main question is very clearly identified. What is the main question in the book? It is about the structure and function of human cerebral cortex, or in other words, how is it that the human brain gives rise to intelligence and intelligent behavior? What is it about the structure and function of human cerebral cortex and its, uh, its components, its units, which are cortical columns that give rise to intelligent behavior. Although, here's a little footnote, if he embraced the dual duality that he begins, begins the book with the duality of the old brain, new brain, if we fully embrace that kind of du duality, it would lead to a variation on the old Cartesian theme, the Cartesian dual dualism. So this is, I think, Cartesian dualism in, in a new guise, like the soul and then the body. Here, we, what we find in this duality between the new brain and the old brain, that if you really consider them as strictly separate from each other, as separate kind of personalities and entities and processes and tendencies, we find, we accept that the new brain is intelligent but has no passion, has no drives, cannot motivate itself. The old brain is passionate, highly motivated, but unintelligent. And then there's a conflict and negotiation between these two. Of course, we don't have to accept the strict dichotomy between the old and the new brains. Just like how we can't say that in a parent-child relationship, the child is the one that has needs and is highly motivated. And the parent is only supposed to follow the child's needs. No, the parent can also train the child in some ways. Of course, it, it, that training is not denying the passions of the child passions of the old brain. 
is not about denying and refusing it, but it is about directing it in the, as a kind of a long-term part of that interaction. Next, other good things in the book. Uh, there's a really good discussion about confidence in an idea, confidence in a, in a theory. This is a personal side of the, the journey that Hawkins shares with us. It, he has an idea, an insight, an aha moment, and a lot of confidence. He feels a lot of confidence about that idea, even though the idea is not directly tested yet. So he explains why, it, why we can come to have high level of confidence in our new ideas that are not yet tested. And it has to do partly with the fact that the idea already connects and explains, accounts for a large set of observations and uh, ideas and things that you, you've read and experienced. And so there's a lot of, already a lot of indirect support, which means that this new theory has, has elegance in it and it is able to connect and account for uh, in addition to giving rise to new predictions. So that's, I found that a uh, useful discussion. The main ideas in the book, the main ideas with the help of which he explains cortical function, these are, I think, three, four main concepts. The concept of prediction, the, the fact that the human brain, the fact or idea that the human brain is always tacitly predicting. It is not obvious to us, but there's an ongoing tacit prediction, not just a single prediction, but multiplicity of predictions that enable this smooth stream of experience. That's one idea, prediction. Next, uh, is, there's the idea of reference frames, uh, which is slightly different from the idea of model or map. And then there is the concept of the multiplicity of reference frames and models. The human brain doesn't generate one reference frame, but a multiplicity, pl plurality of reference frames. So these core concepts are explained clearly, and Hawkins shows why these are core concepts, why they are at the core of thinking about cortical function. And uh, I also found it useful to draw a parallel to Darwin's core concepts, which are at the, at the heart of the theory of evolution. Next, what is also good about the, the book is that it introduces the idea that movement and the sense of movement is an essential and global feature of the brain. That every part of the brain, everywhere in the brain, uh, there is sensitivity and responsiveness to movement, including areas that process language. And this, is, this connects the discussion to the literature on metaphors. Why is it that with abstract concepts, when we think about the concept of time, when we think about the concepts like rationality and positive and negative affect, why is it that we cannot easily shake off our metaphors that come from space, our spatial metaphors. That's because space is everywhere. The sensitivity to space and movement is, a, is an essential and global feature of the brain. Now, the, one of the, I think, best things about the discussion is that it poses, Hawkins poses a challenge to this old and dominant uh, view that the brain is strictly organized as a hierarchy, that the brain is divided into low levels in the hierarchy and the high levels in the hierarchy. And low level, uh, the cortical parts in the cortex that are considered low level, they are responsive to very simple features like a line with a particular orientation. And as we go up in the hierarchy, the cortical hierarchy, we find cells that are responsive to more and more complex and more and more meaningful and increasingly unique objects. In, for example, the idea of the grandmother cell has to do with the idea that the higher level of the cortical hierarchy, there are cells that respond to your grandmother, regardless of from which angle and from which distance and which clothing you, you see your grandmother. Uh, the cells or collection of cells or cell is sensitive to uh, that high level meaning. So Hawkins challenges that hierarchical organization idea and says at least there are other ways in which the cortex is organized. And in general, it is very good to read a book that dis distinguishes between a theoretical work in neuroscience and psychology, on the one hand, doing theory, testing theories, thinking about theories, and on the other hand, empirical studies. That is something that deserves more attention. Okay, so my criticism. First, I just have a few things. 
And my one criticism is that history of neuroscience is not adequately covered. We read about Francis Crick as a major inspiration for the author. We read about, especially major inspiration to pursue theory, unification, theoretical unification, coherence in neuroscience. That comes from Francis Crick's article that there is a lot of data, but there's no unity. We also read about Vernon Mount Mountcastle. And Vernon Mountcastle is presented almost in a mytholo mythological way. He's, his presence and his relationship with the author is mythologized. What do I mean by that? Mountcastle is not introduced as one among many predecessors. Instead, Vernon Mountcastle is presented as a very unique and prophetic master who was relatively obscure, relatively unknown, and somebody who, has, who had insights and intuitions without the right kind of justification. So the, mythologies, the mythologized relationship between Hawkins and Mountcastle is like the relationship between the contemporary genius who is fulfilling the prophecies of a master who came before him. Uh, so this is a little bit of an exaggeration, I think. But it is, effect it is rhetorically very effective. I wanted to read a little bit from people like Kevin O'Regan, Alvin Noe. O'Regan and Noe wrote a paper, an important paper in 2001, talking about the sensory motor foundation of consciousness. Also, I wanted to read a little bit about Carl, Carl Friston, who has done a lot of work on uh, prediction, predictive coding in the brain as a, frame, as a general framework. And people like Wolfgang Prince and Bernard Hommel. People, I am relatively more familiar with them. So a little bit more historical connections would have been useful. You know, maybe in a follow-up, more technical book, I would love to read from Hawkins, talking about how his ideas differ from the ideas of Friston, for example, or Wolfgang Prince or Kevin O'Regan. Or how is the idea of a thousand brains different from the multiple draft theory of Dan Dennett, which he wrote about at least since 1995, that, in that book, Consciousness Explained. Um, so the, that was one of the things that I was reminded of. The multiple draft theory of Dan Dennett seems very similar to uh, a thousand brains theory. All right, finally, Part one, which is a really great part of this book, doesn't really fit neatly with parts two and three. Part two is about artificial intelligence and how artificial in intelligence is, at the moment, mostly inspired by the wrong kinds of brain theory. And they could be inspired and informed by this theory that Hawkins is arguing in favor of. And the third part of the book is about extraterrestrial communication, in part and in part, the idea that human beings should be regarded as, in terms of their knowledge, more so than being regarded in terms of our uh, genetics and genes. We should try to perpetuate and protect our knowledge, what we know, as opposed to protecting our, our genetics. So when I turn to part two and three, um, my impression is that we are now reading an intelligent person's reflections on other topics, like, okay, I've done a lot of work on modeling cortical functions. Now, hear me out. I have some other reflections on, on general, general ideas about artificial intelligence, about the pursuit of immortality by humans, the idea that we, we can transfer our consciousness to machines. I have a few things to say about that. And I also have a few things the author is telling us. We have a few things about to say about extraterrestrial terrestrial contact, contact with um, intelligence and living beings on potentially, on, possibly on other planets. So the style is like, while I have you here, while I have you, now that you have read the first part of the book, which is my serious theoretical work, a summary of my theoretical work about the brain, while I have you here, let me say a few more things about some other topics. So in that sense, as Richard Dawkins uh, writes in the foreword to the book, the book is not really driven by a single idea. It's a collection of ideas that are loosely connected to each other, very loosely. But the book is worth reading for the reasons that I, uh, I said already. And uh, if you have read the book, if you're planning to read the book, if you agree or disagree with my review, I would love to hear from you. Uh, for now, I think that's good. Uh, otherwise, I will... Speak with you soon.